Well, if you've been with us the past several weeks, we've been journeying through the last 24 hours of Jesus leading up to this culminating point of the crucifixion. And today we come to that point where we wrestle with what's going on now. Jesus has finally made it to the cross. And we have to kind of reconcile and and deal with and, and sort of think about what is actually happening in that moment. So I got a question for you guys today. Let me start off with a question for the guys. How many times have you upset your wife or girlfriend and knew you done messed up? I see some chuckles and some fingers kind of starting to point a little bit there. (laughs) How comfortable was that couch that night when you went to sleep? (laughs) Not, Not very comfortable, right? And then the next question. What did you do next to start the process of fixing that wrong you did? Buy her flowers, right? That's the go-to, right, gentlemen? <laughs> now, sometimes it, sometimes it might be just a little, a small love note, maybe something just to kind of start the process and sort of chip away at the, the tension there, maybe. Or like you said, maybe sending some flowers with that note attached to it. it. It sort of softens the blow a little bit. Or perhaps you maybe went even beyond that. Maybe you did even more than that, just to show how devoted you are to that beautiful Wonderful, amazing, incredible, smart, funny, stunning woman that you valued above all other things. Now ladies, perhaps you've experienced that in your life. Or it's even maybe possible the shoes were on the other feet, right? Sometimes that happens too. Either way, Either way, I want us to have that picture in our mind because that is really the sacrificial work that happens in reconciling two parties where wrong has happened. And we're going to focus on that kind of idea in particular today as we kind of look at this crucifixion now as we come to that point in our story. Now the word crucifixion easily conjures up these pictures in our minds, right? We see this man hanging on a cross as the onlookers are weeping before him. But see, a lot of our artwork cleans up the reality of crucifixion. And that's important for us to recognize, because crucifixion is a gruesome, awful thing to behold. This was a terrifying death to experience. But it was an incredibly effective deterrent that the Romans used when they conquered people. Historians from around that time have a lot to say about the act of crucifixion. I want to share some of those with you this morning. Josephus calls crucifixion the most pitiable of deaths. Cicero called crucifixion the extreme and ultimate punishment of slaves and the cruelest and most disgusting penalty. This is the one that really drove it home for me, though. Seneca said that if you knew there was a likelihood you would be arrested and crucified for what you were about to do, it would be better for you to take your own life. The word crucifixion has the same root word that created the word excruciating. That should tell us something about how nasty that experience would have been to be crucified. Now the punishment was so effective because it wasn't done in secret. Crucifixion was done in the main thoroughfares of the cities where it was taking place so that everyone witnessed it. After being flogged, the victim of crucifixion would carry the horizontal beam of the cross with them, which could sometimes weigh as much as 100 pounds. I can barely lift the 100 pounds right now, let alone after I've been beaten to a bloody pulp. And they would take that horizontal beam then to where that vertical beam was already waiting for them, where they would be crucified. Often, after the condemned person had finally passed away from crucifixion, their bodies would be left on the ground for the animals to eat. Or they might be tossed in the trash pile but they weren't allowed to be buried, typically. However, Jerusalem had one exception. They could bury their dead. 
But generally speaking, this was meant to inflict not only pain and agony on the crucified, but to remind folks, when you do this, you aren't even worth our time to clean up. Now, the goal of crucifying someone was to try to cause as much pain as possible for as long as possible until they passed away. It could be days before a victim of crucifixion finally succumbed to death. And there were a few possibilities for how the Romans might actually put someone on that cross. Sometimes the arms were simply just tied up there with rope. The other option was to drive nails through the wrists, which in those days were considered part of the hand. But the feet were always nailed to the cross. In the case of Jesus, a lot of the portraits we have have this picture of his feet kind of overlapped on top of one another on the front of the cross. But recent archaeological evidence actually suggests that he might have had his legs bent a little bit with the feet on the side of the vertical beam, with one five-inch nail driven through each ankle sideways. Either way, I can't even imagine hanging on a piece of wood with five-inch nails in my ankles. Now, it's common for us to imagine uh, in those pictures, Jesus is high above the crowd, probably as high as some of the lights in this sanctuary, clearly displaying the fullness of his sacrifice in that moment. But it's more likely that the cross was only about nine feet tall. Barb, can you come up here for a second? I'm going to demonstrate. So you guys can get a visual of just how close Jesus may have actually been to those who were witnessing this. I can just have you stand beside me here. I almost fall off the chair. Here we go. We're good. We're good. It's a sacrifice I'm willing to make for everyone. This is probably all all the farther away Jesus was from the people witnessing this crucifixion. He wasn't high up in the sky away from them. We could have a conversation right now, couldn't we? Yeah. Yeah. This would be very easy for us to talk to one another. Yeah. That's how close. Yeah. You might, might feel a little pain in the morning, but this is how close Jesus was on the cross. And that's important. Because there's a reminder that Jesus is not removed from the suffering, but stepped into it completely when he was on the cross. The conversations that could have been had, the depth of the eyes that they could look into as he suffered. We can't miss that, folks. We can't miss just how close Jesus was to those weeping over him and hurling insults upon him. Thank you for your help. So as Jesus was hanging on this cross, the question becomes, how did he die then? And there's a few possibilities there. Now, as I said earlier, sometimes it could take days for someone to pass away on a cross. But we know for Jesus, it only took about six hours. And there's probably a lot of pieces that we don't know for sure caused that. But there's a few reasons people passed away typically from crucifixion. The first one, as some experts think, was asphyxiation. They literally couldn't breathe on the cross. As they're hanging there with their their ankles and, and arms stretched out on this cross and feet nailed in, they would slowly continue to slump down. But in order to exhale, they would have to hoist themselves up to open their airways. But as they continued to do that and continued to hang and their muscles began to weaken, slowly but surely, they would lose the energy to hoist themselves up anymore. And eventually, their breathing would shallow to the point that they could no longer exhale at all. And asphyxiation would finally take its toll. Now, other scholars have suggested that maybe congestive heart failure played a role as the fluid would build up around the heart from the beatings that they received and the stress that their bodies were under. Still others might suggest the loss of fluids from dehydration or hypovolemic shock would have played a role. Either way... It could have been any of these that ultimately killed Jesus' physical body. But regardless, it was effective in torturing to the point of death. And Jesus, bloody and naked, would have ultimately died from one or more of these complications. Now we know why the Jewish crowd, the the, the leaders of the day, the Romans, wanted to crucify Jesus, but he faced it. 
so willingly and without hesitation. Why would God send Jesus knowing this would happen? The author of 24 Hours That Changed the World, whose book I'm using to kind of structure these sermons, um, Adam Hamilton, reminds us that we as Christians look to this point in the story as the historical event in which God worked for the salvation of the whole creation. Listen to what Paul says in Romans 5, verses 6 to 11, when he's helping new believers in Rome kind of understand this moment in the story. This is what Paul says. You see, at just the right time, just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person. Though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. Listen to this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Gosh, Paul makes it so easy sometimes, doesn't he? Now, there's a lot of theories out there on just exactly what happened on that cross. And each of them has grounding in Scripture. Each of them has a case to make. We might consider the penal substitutionary atonement theory, which is a big bunch of theological words that simply mean we recognize Jesus took the punishment that we rightly deserve for himself so that we didn't have to. Or we might consider the moral influence theory, which reminds us just how deep our sin ran and just how wide God's love and mercy is, which is meant to help move us to repentance when we recognize it. But another very scriptural theory that I want to focus on today ties into the sacrificial system of atonement of the ancient Hebrew culture. We see in as early as Genesis 4, a witness of offerings being made to God sacrificially. Things like grains, animals, wine, oil, and even the very currency of the day were given to God as expressions of gratitude, devotion, love, and worship. When we place our offerings and tithes in the plates during worship like we have today, we should think of it as more than just meeting a budget or winning God's favor. That's not what it's about. It's so much more than that. This is a gratitude to God. This is an expression of our faith in Him. We should recognize that this is our opportunity to commit to God what is already His. And this is simply an act of stewardship and a desire to put God first in our lives. Now, sacrificial offerings, as they continued in Scripture, became a way of processing sorrow, contrition, and repentance over a transgression and sin, like we talked about before. And once sin entered the picture all the way back in the garden, our relationship with God was permanently broken. So the Lord placed a sacrificial system in place of offerings in the Old Testament. This was a provision to fix that relationship, but Sin never fully was dealt with through that. And therefore, we had to keep offering and keep offering these, these sacrifices to atone for our sin. In time, the Day of Atonement was instituted, Yom Kippur, if you look on some calendars. And it would serve as a special offering in the life of the people. On that day, the high priest would take 
a bull and a goat. And he would offer these as coverage for the sins of himself, his family, and all the people of God in that moment. And this was a very dramatic scene, and it always ended with the high priest taking a second goat. And, and uh, figuratively, he would place the sins of the people on that goat and send it off into the wilderness. And that scapegoat, that's where we get that term scapegoat, would represent their sins being carried away. Now, through this, this lens of the sacrificial system of the Old Testament, we can kind of better understand what's happening in this moment with Jesus' role in our salvation as the high priest and sacrifice rolled into one. Jesus prepared himself for this role as the intermediary between all of humanity and God, as well as making himself the very unblemished lamb sacrifice that was needed. And as part of the Trinity, Adam Hamilton suggests that his wounds are a perpetual reminder of the price he paid for us to restore us in that relationship once and for all. No more would the blood of animals be necessary to fix things time after time. Instead, forgiveness, mercy, and the grace of God would be forever offered through Jesus Christ's spilled blood on the cross. Now, in sacrificing in our own lives, we not only reconcile with one another, we demonstrate a love then in our lives from God that goes deeper sometimes than can fully be understood or explained by words. I want to tell you a story that kind of demonstrates this a little bit. While he was on vacation in Florida, Gareth Griffith decided to try skydiving. He was jumping in tandem with Michael Costello, an experienced instructor. Now, do we have anyone who has skydived before? Because before this story, it was on my bucket list. <laughs> As the two exited the plane to experience this free fall, something went wrong. The main chute failed to open. No big deal. There was a backup chute for that reason. But the backup failed too. And the two men started to violently spin as they realized and, and experienced the, the fear of what was happening as they realized it. Now the instructor finally corrected the spin that they were in so that Griffith was below him and Costello was on top. But as they neared the ground, the instructor folded his arms and legs and caused the pair to rotate. And in doing so, the instructor hit the ground first, cushioning Griffith's blow. Griffith survived, but Costello wasn't so lucky. He sacrificed his own life for a man he barely knew so Griffith could live. Maybe skydiving is not so appealing to you. But here's a story I think that will stir us all as well. In his book, Written in Blood, Robert Coleman tells the story of a little boy named Johnny, whose sister Mary needed a blood transfusion. Now, she had a rare blood type that she shared with her brother Johnny. And the fact that little Johnny had recovered from the very same disease two years earlier made the chances of success even greater to heal Mary. Now the doctor sat Johnny down and tried to explain all this to him, pointing out that without the transfusion, his sister would most certainly die. Would you be brave and give your blood to your sister, the doctor asked Johnny hesitated. His lower lip began to tremble. Then he smiled and said, sure, for my sister. The time came for the operation and transfusion to happen, so the two children were wheeled into their hospital room, Mary pale and thin, Johnny robust and healthy. 
He smiled at his sister, then watched as the blood traveled out of his body down that clear plastic tube. Slowly, Johnny's smile began to fade. And as he lay there feeling weak, he looked up at the doctor and asked, Doctor, when do I die? See, Johnny thought that giving his blood to his sister meant giving up his life. Yet because he loved his sister so much, he was willing to die for her. You and I are like Gareth Griffith, and we're like Mary. Sin sends our life into a spiral as we fall toward the ground. We're sick, deathly ill with sin. And we need a cure. We need someone to save us. Jesus came to bring the cure. To be the one who would flip us around and take the blow that was coming. He did it because he loved us. He died so that we might live. And that we would be reconciled to God once and for all. And if we know that all of us in the world are headed for that death, that we are all part of that spiral in the air, headed toward the ground, that we are all headed for that sickness culminating in something so tragic. And we know that there's a cure, that there is someone to save us from that. Shouldn't we all consider what we might be willing to give to take that out to those people who need to hear it? Amen.